Hello everyone, I'm Joan Gable, President of the University of Minnesota and University Vice Chair for the Council on Competitiveness. In just a few moments, I'll be joining Lonnie Stevenson, President of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers for an important panel on the future of learning, skills, and work. But first, I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing someone who really needs no introduction. She was described by the New York Times as a former prosecutor with made for state fair charms to Vogue magazine describing her as personable, popular, and pragmatic. We all know Senator Amy Klobuchar from her reputation of putting partisanship aside to help strengthen our economy and support workers, businesses, and innovation. In 2019, an analysis by Vanderbilt University ranked her as the most effective Democratic Senator in the 115th Congress, and I can think of no one more effective around what the Council on Competitiveness does or what it aspires to do. I know her personally as an effective difference maker on behalf of Minnesotans, and I know many others who were introduced to her during her run for president in 2020, and also by the integral role that she played in the planning and coordination of the inaugural ceremony for President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Among her duties there, she provided the welcoming remarks at the ceremony and introduced the newly sworn in president for his inaugural address. But here, you'll get to see her today as our funny, brilliant friend, advocate. And I think you'll see the side of her that allows her to share her bold vision for competitiveness in the future in the United States of America. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Senator Amy Klobuchar. Thank you, Joan, our University of Minnesota president, for that kind introduction and for all you do for our state. I think you know how much I love the university. My dad, a proud graduate, my husband, a proud graduate, and I can hardly think of any institution that does more to keep our state competitive than the University of Minnesota. I'd also like to thank Deborah Wynn Smith and Brian Moynihan for all they do for the Council on Competitiveness. We're here to talk about the future because the choices we make today are going to determine America's place in the global economy in the years ahead. That's why we need big economic goals and a bold vision for sustained growth for generations to come, a competitive agenda for America. We need to be a country that makes stuff, invents things, and exports to the world. So I am laser focused on moving our economy forward by making progress on the fundamentals innovation, infrastructure, and bringing down costs, costs, all of which will help us grow. I think with the pandemic, we all see the light at the end of the tunnel, or more aptly, as the Duluth mayor has said, we see the lighthouse on the horizon. So this should be a moment in time that we think about the next big thing and all the bold things we have to do to compete in the international economy. Let me start with infrastructure. From the highways and bridges that connect our cities to the ports and railroads that connect our supply chain, to get the stuff to market and really compete internationally, uh, we've got to have an infrastructure system that's for this century, not the last one. High-speed internet that lets businesses reach customers. As you know, we just made a huge once-in-a-generation investment in our future by passing the bipartisan infrastructure law. I was especially focused on that last issue I raised, and that is high-speed internet broadband. That's a bill I lead in the Senate. Representative Clyburn uh, leads it in the House, and it basically was included uh, in this major bill. So this process wasn't easy, messy. You know a little bit about that in academics, President Gable. Things aren't always easy. But after a lot of long negotiations and late nights, I'm proud that the legislation was ultimately supported by every Senate Democrat and 19 Senate Republicans. Here's what the bill means. Fewer potholes, more reliable Wi-Fi, safer bridges, less traffic, high-speed internet for every American who currently lacks it. Importantly, it also addresses the root causes of some of the supply chain issues that have come into focus in recent months. These are things that can't be ignored when you look at, and they have been ignored for years, even before the pandemic, when you look at what's happening, right? If we want to increase our competitiveness, we need to update our ports, our freight rail. We can't have miles of lines of empty cars waiting to be filled. Another big part of this legislation is creating a lot of good paying jobs, an estimated 1.5 million jobs per year for the next 10 years to be exact. And if you're doing the math in your head right now, you probably can, or that's why 
you're involved in competitiveness policy, you're probably thinking, that means we need a lot more workers because we don't even have enough for certain jobs right now, and you're right. So that gets us to the second big question and challenge we're working hard to address as we look at our competitiveness. How do we put people back to work and have people go into the jobs that we need? So here's what I think. One, we need to help Americans access apprenticeships, skills training, and community college so they can prepare for this century's jobs. Two, we need to make sure moms and dads can access affordable childcare and help for aging parents so they can return to the workforce. We've lost a whole bunch of people, as you know, during the pandemic, and so far, many of them gone back, but not all of them. We must finally pass immigration reform, especially when you look at things like tourism and agriculture, where we just don't have enough workers, particularly in some of our rural areas. So what's the answer? Well, rebuilding our workforce is about increasing wages. Yes, some of that's going on right now. But it's also that apprenticeships, education, and training people for jobs. How I like to talk about this is, so we don't have a shortage of sports marketing degrees. Congratulations to all who've gotten them. But we have a shortage of plumbers, electricians, healthcare workers, computer programmers. Earlier this year, the Senate passed legislation, it's called the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, that makes a historic investment in STEM education. This is going to go a long way toward protecting our innovative edge, but we can't stop there. We have to take a wide-reaching approach to workforce development. A 2019 study by the Midwest Economic Policy Institute found that every dollar spent on apprenticeship programs in Minnesota increased my home state's GDP by 21 bucks, meaning apprenticeships are an investment we can make not just in workers, but in the economy too. Uh, that's why I have been focused on this. Senator Collins, Republican of Maine, and I introduced the American Apprenticeship Act, um, and Senator Moran of Kansas and I also introduced another bill, the Apprenticeship to Colleges Act, to help more people get the skills they need to work in high demand industries. Now, what's right on our plate? I think you know. You've heard the words, Build Back Better, also known as BBB. Great marketing idea. No, whatever. Build Back Better Act. Okay. So what that does, right there, right in front of us, is to make the most significant investment in skills training in community college and generations. When we get this signed into law, I know these programs are going to make a world of difference for our economy, businesses, and our workers. I've seen this in my own family. My grandpa worked 1,500 feet underground in the iron ore mines in northern Minnesota. He never graduated from high school. He was helping to raise his brothers and sisters. He was the oldest boy. There were like nine of them, as well as my dad and his brother. So my grandpa, he did well when he was in elementary school and middle school, but he had an obligation. And so what he did is he went to work every day, went down in that cage in that mine with this black lunch bucket that my grandma would pack for him. And he saved money in a coffee can in the basement to send my dad to a two-year community college. My dad graduated from Vermilion Community College, which was then known as Ely Junior College, and went on to earn the last two years his journalism degree from the University of Minnesota. He went on to be a sports reporter, a newspaper columnist. He interviewed everyone from Mike Ditka to Ronald Reagan to Ginger Rogers. When he retired in 1995, he had written 8,400 columns and about 12 million words and was voted the nation's most outstanding columnist in 1984. Community college, with his own dad not even getting to graduate from high school. My sister, she didn't graduate from high school either. She had some issues with in high school. She went on, she worked in manufacturing. The story is repeated a lot in our country. Then she got her GED. And what did she do then? Once she was comfortable with getting that GED, she went to a community college, got her two-year degree, went on to get a four-year degree, and ended up getting that year the highest scores in the accounting exam in the state of Iowa, and she's been employed ever since. Those are stories that still resonate today with so many families. Every person in this country deserves that chance. Every person in this country deserves that chance. And by making sure Americans can find apprenticeships and afford skills training in community college, we can make sure that they get a fair shot. Next, we have to look at how we get people back to work. 
because as I noted, the pandemic's taken a significant toll. Now, you may not know these numbers. Tragically, nearly 200,000 working age Americans have died from the coronavirus. 200,000 working age Americans and 5 million of their workers left the workforce as a result of the pandemic. Some have retired, aren't coming back, but many could. On top of that, the lack of accessible, affordable childcare, which was a problem way before the pandemic, has had a particularly pronounced impact on working moms, 1.6 million of whom have struggled to return to the workforce as a result. If you don't have childcare for your kids, but you want to go back to work, you're probably not going to go back to work if there's no one to watch your kids. Since this pandemic began, moms and dads have been balancing their toddlers on their laps and their laptops on their desks, teaching their first graders how to use a mute button, something they do better than senators for the most part. Um, and people are really frustrated. They've gone through a lot. I know you know it from the workplaces that you're in. And when I've traveled across my state, I've heard from parents in rural, suburban, and urban areas that the cost of childcare is stopping them from returning to their jobs. Right now, we have the opportunity, really, of a legislative lifetime to offer a life raft to every family who has struggled with how to balance child care responsibilities against paid work. Sets a limit on what percentage of your income can go to child care, 7%. That's in that Build Back Better bill, along with help with aging parents and bringing cost of prescription drugs down and the apprenticeship I just talked about. So I'm working with my Senate colleagues on this bill to make sure it's going to happen. Of course, to truly address our workforce shortage, and this is my final point on this, we've gone through you know, getting the people the training they need, giving the people the help so they can go to work, whether it's aging parents or childcare, but we also need immigration reform. Our broken immigration system is hurting our economy, and we simply can't afford to shut out the world's talent. Just look at the Fortune 500 companies. Almost half of those companies were founded by immigrants or children of immigrants, including Hormel and 3M in my home state. More than 30% of all U.S. Nobel laureates were born in other countries. And think about all the immigrants who are now working as construction workers, healthcare professionals, other frontline employees, often in rural and underserved areas. I have worked on immigration issues since I came to the Senate in 2007 when Senator Ted Kennedy asked me to work on immigration reform. And I was part of the successful bipartisan effort to reform the immigration system. Bill we passed out of the Senate in 2013, unfortunately died in like John Boehner's freezer somewhere over there in the House next to the frozen peas, never got anywhere. Um, but this is literally our third and biggest moment passed a bill in the House before, we passed a bill in the Senate before. All these efforts have been bipartisan. And while we continue to work on broad-based immigration reform, and of course we had some headwinds when President Trump was always against moving forward on it, we can still do everything we can help for businesses to find the workers they need right now. That's why I have pushed to make progress on this issue. I support giving undocumented immigrants the certainty they need to live and work without fear of deportation. And there are ways you do this, that you make sure that people uh, that have not committed crimes, um, that have been in this country for a certain period of time, you can have them on a path to citizenship. You can give them work permits, meanwhile, um, to make sure uh, that we are using the workforce that we have and can get. The other piece about it is visa changes and making it easier to move, uh, to move bills and to be able to um, make sure that we have more help to get more workers in this country. This is what we have to do to stay competitive. Immigrants don't diminish America. They are America. We know there are hardworking people in every corner of our country and around the world. We have to make sure that they get in the jobs we have. I think now's our time to focus on this competitive agenda to build 21st century infrastructure that meets the demands of the 21st century economy, to expand our workforce with talent both here and abroad, to make sure we have true competition by doing something about consolidation, which is a whole other story for another day, but you can read my book, Antitrust, to strengthen our entire economy by making sure our workers are ready for the jobs of the future. Now's our time, and we have to rise to the occasion. I want to again thank the Council on Competitiveness for offering me a chance to speak today. Enjoy the rest of the event. You deserve it. Happy holidays.
Good afternoon. I'm Bill Bates, Executive Vice President with the Council on Competitiveness, and we're now going to continue our conversation on the future of learning, skills, and work. I'm honored to welcome the Council's Vice Chairs for Academia and Labor, Joan Gable, the President of the University of Minnesota, and Lonnie Stevenson, the International President of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Joan, Lonnie, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. As you know all too well, Globalization and rapid advancements in disruptive technologies are affecting the workforce, creating new opportunities for jobs, but also hardships for a lot of workers. Today, such impacts on the workforce are coming at a rapid pace and honestly are likely to accelerate in the years to come. That means that individuals, companies, unions, educators, trainers have less time to adapt and prepare than they might have in the past when technology cycles were a little longer. So what I want to do is start with this question for the two of you. Given the rapid pace of change and the technological disruptions to many sectors of the economies, what do you see as some of the emerging skills needs for the coming decades? And Joan, maybe I'll start with you and then you can kick it to Lonnie. Well, thank you. And it's nice to see everybody. So when we think about the higher ed role, it can range anywhere from a very specific set of technical competencies that some of our colleagues offer to a very broad set of uh, thinking or critical thinking competencies that are more the focus of some of our higher ed institutions. But if we were to look at higher ed across the board and synthesize all of that, then we think about being educated for the future means being prepared for jobs. It's not just that jobs are changing, it's that the job that you'll have 10 years from now probably doesn't even exist today or the sector that you're working in now will be fundamentally different or be one that doesn't exist today. So how do you teach for, prepare for that kind of future? So from a higher ed point of view, we look at technical skills and making sure we remain current. And obviously we're very dependent and grateful for partnerships like the one we have with unions, with industry sectors, with state governments, with the federal government on that technical skills training. But we also look at human training, the ability to be adaptable, the ability to critically think the ability to be innovative, the ability to lead, the ability to follow sometimes as the case may be, and so that you can be prepared to pivot into something for which you may not have the basic technical training. And then, of course, we're looking very much at data and big data and that side of technology, because that's clearly driving a lot of this innovation. And with that, I would love to hear what Lonnie thinks of this. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Joan. It's a pleasure to join you in this conversation as well and also with the Council on Competitiveness. You know, from the point of view of, of blue collar workers in the construction, there's no doubt right now that, uh, you know, with the recent passing of the bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill, that there's gonna be tremendous job opportunities uh, all across the country as, as we continue to build out that infrastructure. And it's gonna really mean millions of new jobs, but same thing, the, the industry has, has changed tremendously in construction overall, and particularly for the IBEW and electrical workers on both our, our construction side of the house and our members that work in, in utility. And so, you know, we're constantly updating and changing our train our training that we provide uh, through our apprenticeship programs and our journeyman training to continue to, as the new technologies come out, the new challenges that we have, that we have to provide services to the customers um, that we're able to provide those services and be trained, have our members trained and ready to do that work. And so we're excited about it. We see a lot of opportunities and, and a lot of challenges, but I think it's, uh, it's really going to be an exciting time for several years to come um, as, we, as, we, and, you know, as we really rebuild the infrastructure of this country, which is sorely needed. Lonnie, as you look at those updates to some of your training regimens uh, um, that, you're, that you mentioned, is there sort of a a set of skills that you're really seeing are needed now or in the next two to three years that you didn't see maybe 10 years ago? Yeah, I can tell you it's uh, our trade. I'm an electrician by, by trade. And when I went through my apprenticeship a few years back, um, things are completely different. And I remember when I first went on the job, the first journeyman I ever I worked with told me, says one thing about this industry kid is you're never going to quit learning. There's always new ways of doing things, better ways of doing things. And so I've watched that over the years and I see the tools that have emerged that are available for, for our workers now, you know, and the materials, how the materials have changed and the installation of things. And, uh, you know, how much that, that truly is, is 
is there. And that's why uh, we continue to do the training, you know, computer training. I didn't even know, didn't ever think to be doing anything with computers when I went through my apprenticeship, but it's pretty commonplace now for electricians and linemen and everybody else to be doing a lot of electronic things. In fact, a lot of their training is done electronic as well. Uh, linemen, for example, if, they're, if we're testing and learning how to hook up transformers, high voltage transformers, we now have mock-ups where they can do that you know, in the comfort of their home on a computer screen. And if they hook up the wrong wire and they see a big explosion, um, it gets instant feedback that, hey, I didn't do that right. And of course, we'd rather have that explosion on a computer model than out there in live uh, circumstances. But uh, so some great opportunities. Like I said, the tools and materials are uh, constantly emerging, emerging all the time. And there's, so we have to stay on top of that. Great, thanks, Lonnie. Joan, you know, thinking about the university system and obviously your own university, how is, is it evolving a little bit to, to address some of these skills needs? Uh, it, uh, maybe the same sort of question, how, how you thought about it 10 years ago be, compared to how you're thinking about it today. Well, there's really two major changes. There are lots of uh, other changes, but the two big ones are first, as Lonnie describes, our use of technology to deliver content is very different today than it was 10 years ago, and it'll be different again 10 years from now. And also learners have a different expectation that they're expected to be able to access information and content over the course of their life, as Lonnie was saying. So the idea that you're done learning when you get your degree or your certification is becoming a very dated concept. And so we're evolving to meet that with a different type of embracing of the technology so that we can really think of how technology allows you to learn in ways that you couldn't before. And I think Lonnie's example is perfect that it's not just that you're looking at a classroom through your computer screen, although we certainly do that, but it's that you can engage in certain types of learning that didn't exist until we had access to this technology. And that allows our students to do things that they couldn't do. It allows them to spend part of their day in applied experiences that they may not have had time for. It allows us to extend the model of learning well into adult life, which is how students are reframing the average students 30 now, rather than in their mid 20s, the way they were approximately 10 years ago. So higher ed is, you know, meeting the moment, meeting the student, meeting the learner where they are, and leveraging their changes and the changes in our own tools in order to be able to serve them well. I, I want to touch on one other topic here because it's a it's a it's a popular one in the media, especially which is the acceleration of automation. Um, we're talking robots, machines, sensors, uh, whatever it might be, that are increasingly capable of doing what we might consider routine tasks that have in the past made up many many jobs for for lots of workers. How can governments, companies, universities, unions? prepare students and workers to sort of retool and address this challenge that's being brought on by increased and increasingly smart automation. Uh, Lonnie, do you wanna take that one first? Again, you know, as, as, as things continue to go in the automation, we're seeing, you know, even in construction trades because some of the automation, for example, I've seen where there's actually a robot that can lay block, like you got a typical bricklayer where it can be on, you know, and they've got there and they're putting the mortar across there and, you know, and laying the block and, and, uh, you know, it's pretty amazing. And uh, some of the things that they could do, and even on the, you know, the people working out, not in a uh, controlled, uh, say maybe, a, you know, in a, an industrial plant or something, auto workers or others, where you were seeing more and more uh, robotics and, and skills that's even able to be, be worked in the construction industry. We're seeing more and more of our work being done offsite and what we call prefabrication. So as much of the work that we can do and have less workers actually on a construction site um, where they can do that in a controlled environment, running conduit, you know, getting wire pulls and things like that that we do in our industry, we're seeing more and more of our, of our uh, contractors moving into that type of environment. And be quite honest with you, many of our customers are starting to demand that because they, they don't want to, you know, it's less opportunity for accidents, you know, construction still very, a dangerous uh, occupation. And so if we're able to do that work in controlled environments, and you know, maybe uh, instead of having uh, 800 electricians or, or, or other construction workers working on top of each other, if we can do that in other areas through, through prefab 
and automation of the tools that they have in those prefab environments is huge. And we're seeing a lot, we're moving into that very quickly. Right. Joan, thoughts on that? No, I, Lonnie is obviously the expert on what it would mean um, from a hands-on or applied point of view. And then from the teaching side, it's to continue to develop the ability to be innovative, to lead, to adapt, and also to do the research on the robots themselves and develop them in ways that comes from human capital. And, and we're a big part of that part of the conversation as well. Really important point. Thank you so much. And I see that our, our time is up. I know this was a, a quick conversation, but I really appreciate everybody's thoughts and insights and the time uh, that you gave us today. So I want to thank you uh, to my two panelists. Thank and, you. And uh, wish everybody a terrific afternoon and a rest of our session.